We've talked a little bit about how we can use the scientific method um, and make observations about matter. We said that some of those observations were about the classification of matter. We're now going to move into another type of observation where we can use numbers and really discuss um, even more information. So this unit is on units of measurement. We are going to learn to perform calculations using uh, the numbers with um, SI units. This is the International System of Units. We're going to be able to convert between base units and units containing prefixes. And we're going to use and convert between the temperature scales. So we're going to start off with the standard units of measurement. Um, and we're going to go from there into uh, prefixes and derived units. Um, specifically, we deal with density because you have a lab that handles that uh, derived unit. And then we're going to go into the temperature scales. So one type of uh, scientific observation is a measurement. But here we need not only a number, but we need a number and a unit. You can't just say 5. You need to say 5 centimeters. And so you have to have both the quantitative and the qualitative parts. So here we have 1.2 meters, 45 years old, the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It doesn't matter necessarily what your units are, just that you include them. You don't want to say um, leave a number without a unit, especially in lab. Guys, watch that because it ends up being worth quite a few points. For us, we are going to rely primarily on SI units. Now, this is the system of units that scientists around the world generally agree as um, a standard. And so generally when we're reporting in literature, you want to utilize these units as much as possible. Now that does vary according to field, but for the most part these are the units um, that scientists like to publish with. For mass, we use the kilogram. The base unit is just the gram, but for the most part because <laughs> Most objects in uh, tend to be kind of large. We go to the kilogram. Um, and you've probably seen at the doctor's office, after they get your weight in pounds, they convert to kilograms. And because of that, it allows them to compare the average weight of Americans to those of people from other countries. Time is in seconds. Um, it's just a base. I mean, we can use minutes, we can use microseconds, but the standard or the SI unit is the second, abbreviated with an S. In general, the temperature scale that we prefer is the Kelvin, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. We do not like Fahrenheit. We do not like Celsius. We want the Kelvin. The electric current is the ampere. The amount is the mole. It's abbreviated MOL, not an M, guys. An M is for meters. Um, luminous intensity is a candela, and distance is the meter, or the lowercase m. Now, you've noticed these uh, starred ones are the ones that we are going to use primarily this semester. Now, remember, when we are talking about kilograms or mass, um, or mass, which we report in kilograms, mass is different from weight. Mass is the amount of matter. It is a measurement of the amount of matter that the object has. Weight is gravity's pull on that mass, or on that uh, matter. Now. I'm including this here because it's really important you can recognize what unit is the correct standard um, for our exam. So what's the SI unit for mass? It's one of the only ones where we use a prefix. It's the kilogram. 
temperature is a capital K for Kelvin. Time, hopefully time is one that uh, tends to be uh, simple for us because it's the second. Distance, because Americans like to be difficult, we use yards and miles, but the standard that we publish in is meters, and the amount is with moles. Now, it's really, it's nice to be able to have these standard units, but for the most part, we need to be able to change these units from handling something very small to something very big and doing it relatively quickly. One way we can do that is with prefixes. Now, this table is in your reading as well, and what it means is one with the prefix is equal to this number of the base unit. Okay, so for example, let's look at the kilo here. That was a not great, um, there we go. Let's use the kilo. Here we've got a meaning of, oops, one kilometer, for example, is equal to a thousand meters. It could also be liters. One kiloliter is equal to a thousand liters. The idea is one of these with the base unit is equal to that same number without the prefix, okay? Now the ones that I consider the most important are kilo, centi, milli, micro, and nano. For the most part, in this semester, we don't deal with large quantities. We deal primarily with small ones. Now, um, I want you to know kilo because you will see the kilometer, you will see the kilogram in uh, real world settings. Um, these are the ones we tend to use mostly for the math this semester. The centimeter, there's uh, one centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. So you could say one centimeter is equal to one one hundredth oops, of a meter. We could also say didn't mean to erase that. We could also say that one meter, oops, one meter is equal to a hundred centimeters. Either way is primarily um, the same. It's just a matter of preference. Here we have a millimeter. One millimeter has is the same as one one thousandth of a meter, or there's a thousand millimeters in a meter, something like that. Micro, one micrometer is 10 to the negative sixth meter. And nano, which we really don't use nano until unit seven, I think it is, is um, one nanometer is equal to 10 to the negative nine meters. And again, these could be reversed if you don't like negatives. You could say that one meter has 10 to the 9 nanometers, and it's going to be fine. Um, it's just a matter of preference. These are the ones that you will need for this unit, but the ones that are highlighted are going to be the ones I expect you to know for the semester. You can also have more than one uh, unit come together to give a new meaning. We do this all the time with speed, for example. We go a certain distance per time, um, whether that's miles per hour or here I have it in meters per second. The idea is you can use these units to make a new meaning. 
We can also discuss density. Now density is in grams per milliliter. It could also be um, grams per liter, uh, kilograms per, I don't know, uh, microliter. Any density is always going to be some unit of mass over some unit of volume. And we use density in a variety of ways. Um, when you get to lab, you're going to take advantage of the fact that you can dissolve sugar and water to increase the density. Just like syrup is more dense than water, um, you're going to have uh, a reasonably good time in that lab. Now, when we talk about density, the density of water is 1.0 grams per liter. If something has a density that is larger than one, it is going to sink. If it's less dense, it will float. You can kind of think about this in terms of um, things like a penny. No matter how small of a chunk of a penny you take, if you add it to a glass of water, it is going to sink. On the other hand, if you have something that is very lightweight, like oil, it doesn't necessarily matter how much oil you have. You could have a whole bottle of olive oil on top of a couple drops of water. That oil is always going to float. And so you always have things that will go in order of most dense at the bottom to least dense on top. Now here this guy is taking a sorry um, variety of fluids that have a different density and he is going to add them so that they can layer. Now here you had maple syrup which is very dense. Um, you start adding things like milk um, and what is this one? Uh, water and ethanol and it's going to make what is called a density column where the most dense things are at the bottom, the least dense things are at top. And if you were to drop something here like this uh, grape tomato or something, it is going to stay uh, where its density fits. And so um, you can actually kind of see the density of all those things. Density columns are very useful for purification. It is a physical separation method um, because density is a physical property. I used to use these all the time in lab. We would try and separate uh, mitochondria from cell debris. And so I would have a two-layer density column of 14.5% um, and 18.5% um, of a sugar. And we would add the cell sample here, spin it, and then at the end, mitochondria were here, cell debris was here, and then cell membranes would still be up here. And you can use a um, pipette, come down and collect that, and it's a very pure sample. It goes back to the last lecture. Now, um, in addition to derived units, another unit we use pretty much every week in lab is temperature. Um, now you guys are most familiar with Fahrenheit because we are in the US and that's what we use. <sighs> Fahrenheit is um, <sighs> difficult for several reasons. Um, the freezing point of water in Fahrenheit is 32 degrees boiling is 212. It's not a very scientific uh, set of numbers. It's just an arbitrary scale that somebody set. Meanwhile, Celsius is much more scientific in that it sets the freezing of water to zero, the boiling of water to 100, and it gives us a nice 100 point spread between those two values. Okay, now Generally, we can talk about how to convert between these. I would generally choose one of these and just remember that. Um, for me, I think I like this one the best because it doesn't have a negative and so on. But let's talk about 
uh, why this formula is what it is. If you do not want to know why, you just want to memorize, that is fine. But I want to give you the explanation of how this formula is derived. Now, the temperature of freezing of water is 0 for Celsius, 32 for Fahrenheit. So if we're looking for the Fahrenheit temperature, we're going to have to add 32. Okay? So that's where this came from, is this difference right here. As far as this 9 fifths, the boiling point and the freezing point of water for Celsius, you have 100 to 0. For Fahrenheit, you have 212 to 32. That gives us a difference of 100 here, 180 here. So let's talk about that ratio. 180 over 100 is the same as 18 over 10. Divide both of these numbers by 2 gives you 9 over 5. So the temperature in Fahrenheit is 9 fifths times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. That's where this formula comes from. Now, even though we tend to use <coughs> Fahrenheit and Celsius on a regular basis, that is not the SI unit for temperature. We want to use the SI unit of Kelvin. It is not degrees Kelvin, it is just Kelvin. Now, the reason for that is back here, freezing point of water is 32 or 0. That doesn't really talk about true freezing. True frozen or true solid means there is no motion, no vibration. Everything should be completely still. That is what we call absolute 0. And neither Celsius nor Fahrenheit can account for that. And so we needed a scientific scale that would uh, uh, designate absolute zero as the zero. And so we have the Kelvin scale that we use in science where zero Kelvin is the same as absolute zero. Um, it turns out that zero Kelvin is approximate approximately negative 273.15 Celsius, which is just really inconvenient to talk about. So we tend to not use Celsius in science and stick to Kelvin. To convert between Kelvin and Celsius, the Kelvin temperature is going to be 273 more than Celsius, and so you just add 273 to your Celsius temperature to find your Kelvin. If you want, you can also memorize this, but as long as you can memorize one and rearrange, you should be okay. The temperature outside is 73 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? What is the temperature in Celsius and Kelvin? I would like you to pause here and actually work the problem on your own. You will not uh, do as well if you don't try and struggle through some of these problems on your own first. But I am going to assume that now you have attempted those problems and we would work them together just like in class. So we know that the temperature in Fahrenheit is 73. We're looking for the temperature and Celsius. Now, a few minutes ago, we memorized the formula. The temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths temperature in Celsius plus 32. If you memorized it the other way, that's fine. I'm going to assume you didn't. To rearrange for this, the first thing we have to do is subtract 32. So that gives us TF minus 32 is equal to 9 fifths TC. To get rid of the 9 fifths, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal on both sides. And that gives us down here the temperature in Celsius 
is equal to 5 ninths temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. Okay? Now, by the way, this should be in parentheses. Now, um, if we were to take, can I open my calculator here? I don't think I can. Okay. Um, I couldn't open the calculator on top, so we're just going to continue from here. Um, so when we do this, the temperature in Celsius is equal to 5 ninths times the temperature in Fahrenheit, which was 73, minus 32. Now, when you have your calculator, you need to be careful how you enter this, and this is one of those things you absolutely must practice with the calculator you plan to use on the exam. It cannot be a graphing calculator, um, but you need to be comfortable with it. So the way I entered it was 5 divided by 9, parentheses, 73 minus 32, close parentheses, equals. And it gave me something like 22.77 degrees Celsius. Now if you remember, the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273. So we're going to simply take that 22.77, and if you want you could have the 0 .15, plus 273.15 is equal to 295.93. Kelvin. Okay? Um, now, or I guess if you rounded it, it would be 92. The temperature of liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. What is the temperature in Celsius and Fahrenheit? Again, I would really appreciate it if you would pause and work through this problem before you continue. At this point, I'm going to uh, assume that you have done that, and I am going to say the temperature in Kelvin is 77. If we're looking for the temperature in Celsius, we know the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in, uh, well, we know that the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius. And if you want, you can always go back. There's two ways to memorize everything, right? Um, we did this way, the temperature in Celsius plus 273. 0.15. I'll talk about how much of this you need to know later. So if we're looking for the temperature in Celsius, to solve for that, we're going to subtract 273.15 from both sides. It gives us the temperature in Celsius. It's equal to the temperature in Kelvin minus 273.15. Plugging in, temperature in Celsius is equal to 77, oops, minus 273.15 which is basically equal to 196. To find the temperature in Fahrenheit, temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths TC plus 32. So it's equal to 9 fifths T of of negative 196 plus 32. And you end up getting something like negative 320.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Or very, very, very cold. Um, liquid nitrogen is super fun. Um, I wish we had a doer so we could do demonstrations on this campus. 
but at this point that's not possible. That solves it up for this um, unit. We'll talk more about liquid nitrogen and units of measurement later on. Where is, there we go.